Well, Dr. James Tour, welcome to the Tove Podcast. It's a privilege to have you today. Thank you so much. And uh, where are you uh, talking to us from here today, James? I'm in my office in Houston, Texas at Rice University. Okay, very good. Um, I thank you so much for coming on the Tove Podcast today. And uh, let's just start with your background story. Uh, can you tell our listeners where you grew up and uh, what kind of Jewish home did you grow up in? I was born in New York City. I grew up just outside of New York City in the suburbs, just outside about a 20 minute drive down into the city. Um, my home was quite secular. Uh, we rarely talked about God. In fact, I, I only remember one conversation about God and it didn't last very long between my sister and my father. Um, I was in synagogue probably twice a year, something like that. So uh, other than being circumcised on the eighth day, uh, that that was about, about it for me. Okay, so did you have a sense of your Jewish identity growing up or... Absolutely. I absolutely had a sense of my Jewish identity. If somebody had asked me, I would say I was Jewish. Uh, 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 my, my cousins were, were more practicing than I was. None of us were Orthodox, but, but certainly they, they, they practiced more diligently than we did. We got together for the Passover. Uh, uh, and so if anybody had ever asked me, I was Jewish. Mm, yeah, sure. Not only that, you were growing up in what they call the second Holy Land, right? New York. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, in my elementary school, it was, I would say it was uh, 98% Jewish other than the blacks that were being bussed in. Because when I went to first grade, that was the first year of busing in New York City. And so they were being bussed in from the projects. But uh, uh, so as far as I knew, you were Jewish or you were black. Okay, interesting. Uh, so at some point in your life, you heard about the gospel. And uh, how did that happen? And what was it like coming to faith in Yeshua, Jesus, as a Jewish man? Well, I, I, had, I had never really met a Christian that said that they were born-again Christian until I went to college. I I worked in a gas station on the Hutchison River Parkway, just outside New York City. Uh, it was on the parkway and it going south and north, work both sides. And occasionally, Christians would hand me tracts and I would read them on the night shift. And, and a couple of them really struck me. Uh, they were tracts by a man named Chick, Chick Tracts. I don't know if you've ever heard of them, but they're. No, I haven't heard of they're, them. They're, they're, okay, well, yeah, they're, they're kind of outdated now, but. They're, they're really quite vivid, in, and, you know, the, the sinner generally ends up in hell in these tracts. I have seen those and, before, uh, yes. Yes, yes. And so I used to read those and uh, read it several times because we had a lot of extra time, especially on the night shift. But um, when I went to college, a, a young man uh, shared with me in the laundry room in August of my freshman year. And, and uh, well, we got to talking in the laundry room, and he— and he, it was clear to him that I was not a believer. And he had, I had asked him what he wanted to do when he graduated. He said he wanted to be a missionary. <laughs> and and, uh, and I, I thought, why would you want to do that? I didn't even know what missionaries existed today. I thought they'd all been killed off. And, yeah. and he asked me if he could give me a presentation of the gospel. And he was with the Navigators Campus Ministry. Okay. And he gave me the presentation. And that was in August of my freshman year, end of August. And in November of my freshman year, um, I was all alone in my room and I bowed my knee and I asked Jesus into my life. But what really struck me in his presentation of the gospel to me is when he said, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I remember reading that from the Bible and he opened the Bible and I said, I'm not a sinner. Mm. And, and he was a bit taken back by that. And if, as you understand modern secular Judaism, and I understand that now why I would have said something like that, because in modern secular Judaism, it's not a thought that makes you a sinner. You got to do something bad. You got to rob, rob a bank. And I remember I said, I never robbed a bank. I never killed anybody. How could I be a sinner? And then he turned to Matthew 5, 28. For I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. 
And I was immediately convicted because I was addicted to pornography from the age of 14, working in that gas station. I had found magazines. And my first job was to clean the, uh, the parking lots and the restrooms. And I found stashes of magazines, lots of them. And, and um, so I was addicted by the age of 18. And this really hit me. But what's amazing about this is why should I even care? Why should I care what some guy says 2,000 years ago? And some guy named Jesus, I mean, for all I know, Jesus is a Christian, I think. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, why should I even care? But the words really struck me. And I remember looking at him that, that something I do in my heart can make me a sinner, uh, which is, is totally unlike secular Judaism. We're, we're not guilty for what we do in our hearts. Certainly within Orthodox Judaism, it's different. I'm talking about secular. And, and uh, um, so, so he certainly had my attention at that point, and he took me through the, the bridge illustration of the gospel. But on November 7, 1977, when I bowed my knee to the Lord, I asked him to forgive me, and I felt this burden of sin just start lifting from me. Hmm. It was really quite profound. And then all of a sudden, it was as if a man was standing right next to me, and I looked to my right, and I couldn't see anything clearly of a man, but the presence was so overwhelmingly strong, overwhelmingly strong, I just turned toward him and fell on my face to the ground. I was already on my knees and, and just weeping. And I just, there was, I wasn't scared. I wasn't, uh, it was just an amazing sense of love, just overwhelmed by love like I never knew. And I didn't want to get up from there. And he wasn't going anywhere. The mm. presence was so strong. And then the next thing that I remember, I don't know how long I was there. I was standing up, wiping my face. And, and uh, because I had just been weeping and something happened to me at that moment on that day. And this burden of sin that I'd been carrying since August lifted from me. And I didn't tell anybody. And two weeks later, this guy who'd shared with me saw me walking on the floor there in the college in the dormitory because he lived on the same floor. He says, Jim, if you receive Jesus in your heart. I said, I think I have. Why do you ask? He said, you haven't stopped smiling for weeks. <laughs> That's when I changed. Wow. Wow, that's an incredible story and uh, very encouraging. Uh, so here you are, a, a young Jewish guy. You come to believe in Jesus, who, as we both know, uh, really is the, the one thing you're not supposed to believe in as a Jewish person, uh, some would say. Uh, and sa in fact, some people suggest that believing in Jesus and being Jewish should never and can never coexist. So how do you feel about that claim? Have, have you encountered that before? And Yeah, I've encountered that before. That's a bunch of nonsense. I mean, where do they get this? I mean, where do they get this? All of a sudden, out of thin air, they pull this thing. They pull this comment. So, so people say all sorts of things. I mean, some people say the earth is flat. I mean, it's it, it just, <laughs> you, you know, so, so you, people say all sorts of things. It doesn't bother me what people say. But, um, uh, and at the time, I didn't even, so my home was so secular, I didn't even know that I should not believe in Jesus. Mm. And so most Jews are trained against Jesus. I was a clean slate. I never listened to what the rabbis had to say. To me, they looked like strange men. Uh, um, I, I just messed around in the synagogue. I, I, I had no respect for this sort of thing, and it's not something I'm proud of. I'm just telling you that there, there's the fact of it. Sure. And, uh, um, and I had no training. I was not trained against Jesus. So it was amazing how open I was to his claims and the things that he was saying Yeah. Uh, because I had never been trained against him. And it really shows you the effect upon Jewish people that they are trained against Jesus. I share the gospel all the time, Levi. I share it with people... Every week, if I go a week without seeing somebody come to the Lord on a one-on-one -on -one sharing, I feel it's been a wasted week. Mm. And I'll tell you, it's a lot easier to share with someone from China that comes from a, a communist-type background who hasn't been trained against Jesus than sharing with, with a Jew, someone who's been trained against Jesus. I mean, it's, it's, it's devastating training that they're undergoing yeah. uh, uh, in this. And, and um, there's not much in the Jewish traditional Jewish writings about Jesus. What is written is not very kind. And, and you know, he had to be crucified. He, he had to be killed. 
on this high Sabbath because of the degree of his divination, something like that. But, but there's not much written, but what's written is not kind. But then over the generations, it's just been, uh, uh, they have very, they have nothing good to say about the man. And, uh, and y- you can see it in trying to share with people. So, so when the slate is clean, I mean, the, 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 the testimony of the gospel is profound mm. and, it, and it changes hearts and lives really quite rapidly. That, that, that people come around from not believing in the resurrection to believing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ with me in a 30 40 or 40 minute conversation all the time. And these are highly educated people, mm-hmm. Americans, internationals, all the time. But Jews, it's a different thing. And so you see the effect of that training. But as for me, if some rabbi says that the two are, are orthogonal and can't coexist, it means absolutely nothing to me what that rabbi's claims are. Sure. Yeah. And the very idea, the very premise that one's ethnicity can change depending on a belief is, of course, quite absurd to begin with. It's as if your beliefs a- change whether you're, whether you're biologically yeah. male or female. It makes no difference. Right. And, and that they can say a person can be atheist and still be a Jew. But if you believe in Jesus, you're not a Jew. I mean, how ridiculous is that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you've mentioned several times uh, sharing with your colleagues, uh, sharing at work and so forth. Let's talk about your work briefly. Uh, you know, you've been named, Dr. Tour, one of the most influential or one of the top 50 scientists in the world today. Can you explain for our listeners uh, what you do in the sciences? Well, I'm, I'm a, trained as an organic chemist, a synthetic organic chemist. <clears throat> I work across many areas from Bio, biological and medical to material science and, and uh, uh, just hardcore materials for aircraft, for aerospace, and just the gamut. Um, I take inspiration from a, na- a man named Bezalel in Exodus 31. He was the man that Moses hired to build the tabernacle. And God says, I've called my name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the spirit of God and I have given him wisdom and insight and knowledge in all kinds of craftsmanship. And, and so I say, Lord, give me wisdom and knowledge in, in all kinds of craftsmanship. So I work across many different areas. And uh, um, I've started 10 companies, several of them materials companies, three of them uh, pharmaceutical companies. And so it, it runs the gamut. We work across and we work in electronics, we build molecular electronic systems, working devices. Uh, uh, so, so I, I'm uninhibited by these things. And, and I believe that God answers prayer when you, prayer, when you pray these things, things happen. And I look at Bezalel. This was a man that says he could work in gold, in silver, and in bronze. He could work in stone cutting and in stone setting. He could work in wood, in fabric, and perfuming. And he had the ability to teach it. And so, he, he, and, and you ask God and he does it. And in fact, Bezalel was the first man in the Bible, the first man to ever say that he was filled with the Spirit of God. And this guy was a craftsman. Mm. And so so, uh, I, I, so that's what we do. We work across all these different areas, and we publish papers in these areas, and, and I love what I do. I just absolutely love it. Mm. That's wonderful. Well, as you're quite well aware, there's a lot of people who put God and science at completely different ends of the same pole, and they say these two things are completely different. You can't both be a believer in science, and a believer in God. You can't be both, so choose. You're either religious or you're a scientist. However, obviously here you are, a professional scientist. What is it that you've discovered about the God of Israel, the God of the Bible, through your exploration of all the different sciences? Okay, well, through my exploration of the sciences, that that, that clearly the God of Israel is is utterly amazing. I mean, the creator of the universe, to make this universe, and I look at living systems, I look at biological systems, and you go, whoa, this is so complex. I mean, even a cell is a factory. It is so complex. Nobody's ever made a cell. If people say they've made synthetic cells, they have not, they have not, they have not. You're wrong, they have not. They, they, what they do is they take a cell that already exists, and they might take a genome out of another cell and put it into that first cell, or they may, might knock out certain genes in the cell, but they haven't made the cell. So 
nobody knows how to even make a cell, which is the most basic unit of life. Mm. And and you look at this thing, and it's it's extraordinary. I mean, to think, I, I looked at my children when they were growing up, and I was like, how'd you do this, Lord? This is so amazing. I don't know how to make chemicals come together to do this. So, so when I look at this, it just screams out that there's a God. And, uh, but... You know, this is, I certainly don't say this in my classroom in this way. You know, I just say that we're clueless on the origin of life. I mean, that's all I can say in, in, my, in my secular classroom. But um, uh, uh, because that's all you can say as a scientist. You can't as a scientist say, I don't know how this happened, therefore God. I mean, some pastors say that all the time. I can't say that as a scientist. Mm -hmm. Very careful about what I say. Uh, 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 and, and, you know, one day we, we might well understand how, how life formed from, from inorganic and, and small organic molecules. But that day is far away from today, but we just don't know how that happened. So I think it's, it's just, just life, which is on this planet, absolutely ubiquitous, everywhere, everywhere. Um, you just turn over a rock and it is teeming with life. And it's not just the things you see. It's, there's a lot there you, you don't see with your naked eye. But uh, um, and you see, this is extraordinary. You just look at a tree and, and, and you think of the photosynthesis process. And most people don't see this. I see this instantly. I see that, that green leaf and I know that there's a magnesium atom sitting in the middle of a porphyrin. And there's this funnel that funnels photons from the sun into that. It hits the magnesium atom and it ejects electrons. Once it ejects electrons, these then travel this long distance down this chute of hundreds of angstroms that start a photosynthesis process that will take carbon dioxide and start breaking it, breaking it down to make carbon available to the cells in that tree to build that tree. I mean, this is amazing. We don't know how to do that. Right. And so everything I see in a biological system, I'm amazed by this. And uh, uh, so... Uh, that's what in science to me points to God. But again, it does. it's not like you look at DNA and it says the God of Israel was here. It doesn't say that. So, so, so as, uh, as, as it's been put, that, that these things are a sign that point us to God. They, they don't necessarily name God, but they certainly point, it, point me to God. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, to wrap up our first segment here, Dr. Tour, uh, here you are. Uh, you're a Jewish believer in Jesus. You're a scientist. You're clearly a well-educated, influential man. Uh, there are probably some unbelievers listening to this podcast right now. We have uh, folks that listen to the Tove podcast from around the globe, some of whom are certainly Jewish seekers, some of whom uh, just stumbled across this podcast. Uh, what would you say to those Jewish men and women who are curious about the claims of the Bible? Well, I, I would invite you to read uh, Isaiah 52, verse 13, through all of Isaiah 53. Um, and, and you might say, oh, well, I've read all that before. Uh, I'll bet you haven't. I'll bet you haven't. So why don't you just open your Bible and find out? See who's right, me or you. <laughs> Isaiah 52, 13, read it to the end of that chapter, and then all of Isaiah 53. Just read that, and then think about, who is this describing? Who might this be describing? And think about that. And uh, um, why don't you ask God? You know, God lives, and he's a God who answers prayer, and say, Lord, teach me. Who is this writer writing about? Lord, teach me. And let him instruct you. If you think that he's talking about the nation of Israel, uh, have you seen the nation of Israel not cry out? I mean, there's things there that, 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 that say that he's not talking about Israel as a nation, that some might claim. He's talking about a person. He's talking about an individual. Who's this individual that your own scriptures talk about? And the reason why I say that you probably never read it because it's not read on the circuit of what you go through in the synagogue. Why do they skip it? Think about that. Why would they skip this portion? Read it and find out. Mm. It's in your scriptures. Well, that's certainly a great challenge, Dr. Tour. And um, 
there you have it, audience. Uh, Dr. James Tour, uh, a very influential scientist, uh, speaking, saying, hey, crack open your Bible and give the Bible a chance. Give God a chance. Uh, yes, our hearts are not inclined toward him. Our hearts are inclined toward other things. But open up your Bible and read Isaiah 52, 12, all the way through chapter 53, and just allow the Holy Spirit to work. If it's not true, hey, you'll see that. But if it is true, allow the Holy Spirit to work and show you the truth. Well, Dr. Tour, this concludes uh, the first part of our interview. I want to thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, for our listeners, stay tuned for the second part. You're listening to the Tove Podcast. Thank you. Since 1887, Life in Messiah has helped Christians understand the Jewish roots of our faith and God's ongoing commitment to His people. We teach that anti-Semitism is inconsistent with biblical faith and we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, which includes her spiritual renewal as well as physical safety. In all we do, our priority is to share the gospel message. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or at lifeinmessiah.org. That's lifeinmessiah.org.